Hi class, Professor Alabozek. Um, this will be your voiceover content for the um, care of the surgical patient. And here are our readings, like we went over in class, um, preoperative care, intraoperative care, and postoperative care, all in Lewis. All right, so first off, kind of different reasons surgery is performed. Why is it performed? Um, you know, the surgical team made up of a surgeon. We have anesthesiologists. We now have a lot of CRNAs, um, nurses, of course, OR techs, scrub techs, um, of course, the patient and their family. So for diagnostics, um, this is actually going to help us determine any presence or extent of a pathological problem, okay? So a great example that you used in class was biopsies or, you know, for example, a lung nodule. We're going to test that lung nodule to make sure that it is not cancerous. Um, you know, it, just examples like that. So a diagnostic surgery would be something that we needed to do surgery for to use testing on, okay? And a great example, again, with that is a biopsy. Um, curative, okay, so we're repairing a disease process or a condition. Um, an example is like a ruptured appendix, okay? We're going to take that appendix out and we're gonna hopefully cure that patient of that problem. Palliation. So this is kind of more so helping with symptoms of diseases, okay? So we're alleviating symptoms. We're not curing the patient, but we're doing the best that we can to alleviate any uncomfortable symptoms the patient may be going through. Um, a good example that I always like to use is, you know, a brain tumor, maybe reduction. Maybe the location of the brain tumor, we can't take the whole tumor out, but we can take part of it out. Um, the the size of the brain tumor may be putting a pressure on the brain where it's causing constant seizures or it's sitting on a nerve where it's affecting the patient. So if we can take a partial tumor out and help alleviate some of those symptoms, that would be an example of palliation. Prevention. So we're, reduce, we're reducing the risk of a developing problem. Um, and what I, the example I really like to use for this is actually removal of a mole before it may become malignant or turn into some sort of melanoma. Okay, so we're preventing it. We're preventing things before it gets worse. Cosmetic, okay? It can be any, anywhere from, you know, plastic surgery, um, repairing a physical appearance um, after a trauma, a repairing burn scars, um, a mastectomy, you know, um, breast surgery um, after a mastectomy. And exploration, so exploratory. So really behind this is we don't really know what's going on. Um, really, the best example is looking within the abdomen. We see a lot of examples of what they call exploratory laps or exploratory laparotomies. They know something's going on in the abdomen, but we're not quite sure what, okay? Maybe it's saying something on the scan, but it's not definitive. So we have to go on, go into the abdomen and look a little bit further and, and see what's going on, okay? And again, elective or emergency, elective is more planned, um, and emergency is, is something kind of without our control. It's unexpected and um, not within our control. So pre-op interview, how important? So, so important for the nurse and for the patient. Um, so we wanna obtain health information, right? So a big part of this is getting drug and food allergies, even environmental allergies, which we'll go over in a little bit. Um, we're gonna provide and clarify information about the surgery. We're helping assess the patient's emotional status, which is really important, and uh, assess their readiness for their surgery. Um, what are their expected outcomes? Um, what are their expectations of the surgery, okay? What are their expected outcomes that they want to see? And we're there also to help give the patient and family opportunities to ask questions. And this is a perfect opportunity to do that before they're going into the OR, okay? So again, you know, we're getting that health history of the patient, so, so important, okay? Do they have a neurological history, cardiac, renal, okay? We need to need, know those things. Um, what's their family history? Okay, that's really important as well. 
and getting that baseline assessment. Um, I know I said this a lot in class, but I can't tell you how important a baseline assessment is from going to pre-op, intra-op, to post-op, um, to see whether or not things change, okay? Um, so did they go into the surgery moving all four extremities and are they coming out not able to move their right arm? Okay, that's a problem. Pupillary changes. Did they go in with pupils um, a plus two millimeter equal reactive and they're coming out um, dilated for some reason? Okay, and they're and they're fixed. They're so um, there could be many issues as to why things occur and getting that baseline assessment is so important. Um, another example I like to use is that patient, you know, that COPD patient, okay? Typically two liters O2 dependent possibly, um, and they live in the O2 sat range of 88 to 91%, and that's normal for them. So knowing that baseline assessment, would we bump up that oxygen to five liters in the OR? Or, or post-op, I should say. No, probably not, because we know that they would, that wouldn't be good for them, okay? That they would retain um, more CO2 and they become toxic from the oxygen, okay? So just knowing those baseline assessments is so important. Um, allergies, again, are important. Getting those drug allergies, the food allergies, even environmental, which a great example with that is latex. Um, getting that anesthesia consult, okay, knowing what medications are going to work best for the patient for anesthesia, um, looking at the diameter of the neck of the patient, which is really, really important for their airway, okay, um, and intubation, whether or not they're going to know that they're going to have maybe a difficult intubation, intubation or not. Um, does the patient tend to get nauseous? Do they vomit with certain um, anesthetic medications? And what can we do to prevent that? Again, what are their patient's expectations about the procedure and what are their goals? What do they want to see for outcomes? Giving that patient the opportunity to ask questions. Um, should they be taking their scheduled medications that day? Okay, so that's, you know, very typical question. Should I be taking my blood pressure medications that morning of surgery? Should I take my insulin? Um, should I take my vitamins? Or is there any fears that the patient's experiencing, okay? Also educating the patient on what they should expect um, intra-op and post-op. The more the patient knows, it eases so many more fears, okay? It eases their anxiety, it eases their fears. So as much education as we can give would be best. Um, do they use any substance, ETOH, okay? There's definitely certain interactions with anesthesia, and um, we really, that's really important to know. Um, they could also have like a decreased liver function, or we're kind of at end stage liver, depending on um, what type of sub substance they use. Um, and we have know, of course, that with metabolism, with the metabolism of the medications with anesthesia, it may take a little bit longer to clear, especially if they more, are more end stage liver. So a lot of things to keep in mind with that. Um, also post-operative pain control, if there is substance or alcohol, we may have some trouble, a little bit more trouble controlling their pain because of such a high tolerance. Um, okay, moving on to the next slide. And this is a lot of um, kind of what we just went over, but again, establishing a baseline physical assessment is so important. And we know that's so important because we're following that patient pre-op, intra-op, and post-op, and we want to see if there's any changes. Um, we talked about their health history and family history and why that's so important. Um, you know, especially is there any cardiac disease that runs through their family? Um, we would really need to know that. Determine uh, psychological status and coping strategies. So are they ready for this surgery? Okay, um, again, what are their fears? Addressing their fears and educating the patient on the unknown. Um, of course, participating in the identification and documentation of the surgical site. Okay, we even do that in the preoperative interview. So we start as, as early as that um, with checking the correct site of the patient. 
Again, identifying any prescription drugs, is there any over-the-counter medications they take, any herbal medications? Um, because there could also be quite a bit of drug interactions with over-the-counter and herbals, and we'll go over some of the herbal um, products in a little bit. Um, again, we did go over allergies, environmental, food, and drug. It's very important to identify any cultural, religious, and ethnic factors prior to surgery. It may affect the surgical experience. And you gave a great example in class of um, Jehovah Witness and the blood transfusion. Um, so if they are very, very, very against getting a blood transfusion and the surgeon, it would be very important for the surgical team to know this, especially if there is a great loss of blood. So they would need to put a plan in place um, prior to surgery of what would what they would need to do if there were to be an, a large amount of blood loss. We talked about, you know, um, ETOH and substance, but tobacco use is, is very, very important. Um, I know a lot of surgeons today don't even like to do um, surgeries on patients that um, currently smoke, especially if the surgery is, um, is not emergent. So for emergency surgeries, we can't really have control of, over that. But for surgeries that are planned, um, the surgeon can have a little bit more control about smoking cessation for the patient. And they like to see the patient try to quit smoking at least six weeks before the planned surgery. Um, they have a huge risk of going into respiratory distress during and after, um, during the surgery and in the post-op phase. And they're more apt to getting pneumonia, okay? Again, we talked about the anesthesia consult. Um, again, looking at the diameter of the neck for intubation and the best medications for the patient. Also for, you know, control of nausea and vomiting. And, you know, also again, what's the patient's expectations and goals for the surgery and always giving the opportunity for the patient and family to ask questions. So easing anxiety and fears. So, you know, many factors influence the patient's stress. It could be the age of the patient. It could be any past experiences that they've had. Um, sometimes negative experiences can affect the patient going into another procedure with elicit, you know, eliciting more anxiety and fear of the procedure. Um, the patient can have, you know, a huge fear of pain. Um, socioeconomic status can greatly affect this and also their current health status. Um, when we're talking to these patients and educating these patients, it's so important to have, you know, that common language with them, you know, avoiding that medical jargon. It's so essential to use familiar language. It really helps reduce anxiety and it helps them understand and it, they get the education a little bit better. Okay. So giving information about what to expect in all stages, like pre, intra, and post-op, can certainly affect their anxiety and fears and alleviate a lot of their questions. And again, like I said, past experiences can really elicit anxiety. So, so helping them understand that we're going to do everything in our power to make sure whatever happened to you does not happen again. And also, you know, even hearing stories from friends and family um, of what maybe they have gone through before can scare patients going into procedures. So trying to help debunk any maybe myths or um, rumors. <laughs> that the patient may have heard, which is causing more anxiety and fear for them as well. Um, you know, after that informed consent process of, list, of, you know, listening to all the risks, it can certainly increase the patient's anxiety and fears. And, you know, complications are very scary. But um, making sure that we help the patient in their emotional state, we provide emotional support for them. Especially if they have fear of pain, okay, we can we can make, make sure to notify the provider that this patient has a very huge fear of pain and we're going to do everything in our power to control their pain. Um, tell them that we use a 0 to 10 scale of how we can control their pain and we can name off many of the, the medications that we use to help pain control, okay. So reassuring the patient that drugs are available to help eliminate their pain and we're going to do everything we can to do that. Um, so situational changes are a big deal. 
um, especially if this surgery is causing a situational change for the patient. Um, concerns of the unknown, okay? So, you know, a fear of death, a fear of pain, concerns with body image, and it can be just as something as, you know, sometimes a scar is really a big deal to some patients, some patients it's not. So every patient's different. So we want to make sure that we provide the patient with the best um, possible experience. And if they do have that issue with the scar, providing them with emotional support and maybe some help in how to deal with that new scar. Um, again, going over past experiences and trying to provide emotional support about that and um, lack of knowledge. So we're gonna give a lot of education to the patient. So these are herbal products um, that should be, you know, we should not have patients take prior to surgery. So it's always important to notify the provider if the patient states that they take any vitamins, herbs, or dietary supplements because sometimes they may have an interaction. So these are the ones I want you to know. So avoiding astragalus and ginseng. These will increase blood pressure before and during surgery. Avoiding garlic, vitamin E, ginkgo, and fish oil. This increases the risk for bleeding. And avoiding kava and valerian, and it causes excessive sedation. Okay, so here is our pre-surgical review of systems. So this is our assessment, and this is our assessment baseline, right? So remember how much how important this is to our patients to get that baseline through um, pre-op, intra-op, and post-op. So cardiovascular, getting that good history. Do they have high blood pressure? Um, do they have angina or chest pain? Do they have arrhythmias or dysrhythmias? Heart failure, have they had an MI? Do they have any implantable devices? Um, just some examples of cardiac history right here. So what is their current treatment or are they on any medications? So, so do they take antihypertensives? Do they take anticoagulants? Um, do they take any medications that help their dysrhythmias? Um, maybe possibly getting a, a cardiac consult prior to surgery, especially if they do have an extensive cardiac history, wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, they, all patients should at least have a 12 lead EKG prior to surgery, especially cardiac patients, but that's pretty much um, what, you know, the protocol now for everyone. Assessing any edema prior to surgery, um, that really helps us assess how their heart failure may be doing if they do have a history of heart failure. Um, getting those baseline vital signs, okay, what is their baseline? Um, getting those labs and revolving around cardiac, so how is their electrolytes? How's their serum potassium level? Um, especially if they are on a diuretic, um, are they depleted from the diuretic? Do they need um, some electrolyte replacements? How's their coags, okay, their PT, PTT, INR, um, especially if they are, are on a blood thinner or anticoagulant. If the patient has a prosthetic heart valve, okay, it would be a really good idea um, to treat the patient prophylactically with an antibiotic. Um, anything that is implanted has a larger risk, especially to be infected or to have vegetation, which is bacteria around the site. Um, so to decrease any risk, especially in relation to prosthetic heart valve for the risk of an infective like endocarditis um, would be very crucial to have that prophylactic antibiotic. And especially making sure the patient will be wearing TEDs, venous boots, and educating them on that and why we do that. Um, also, other labs, I know you mentioned in class that would be really important, is that CBC or complete blood count. Um, we're getting the hemoglobin, hematocrit, making sure those levels are within normal limits. How are their platelets? Um, getting that um, cross match, that the um, type and screen, getting their blood type, okay, especially if they were need to need, need a blood transfusion during surgery. Okay, and moving on to respiratory. So a few examples of history would be, do they have COPD? Are they O2 dependent? Do they have asthma? Do they have sleep apnea? Okay, um, have they had any recent respiratory infections? 
what does this increase? If they've had a recent respiratory infection, that could definitely increase the risk for any bronchospasms, laryngospasms, um, which results in decreased O2 sat, um, respiratory distress, um, and especially inability to excrete secretions. So that would be a concern. Um, this is asked quite frequently to patients prior to a surgical procedure, and a lot of times if they do have an upper respiratory infection, they'll postpone that, that surgery. Um, do they have a cough? And if they cough, are they coughing up any sputum? Okay, is the cough dry? What does the sputum look like? Is there any hemoptysis? Okay, does the patient smoke? And like we talked about in a few slides back, many surgeons typically deny surgery if patients do smoke and they need to start at least, at least six weeks prior for a smoking cessation, okay? And they need to be six weeks smoke free. It increases the risk of infection so much more in patients um, for surgery. We need, may need to get that baseline ABG depending on their respiratory disease. Um, what's their baseline pulse oximetry? Um, do they need to go for any pulmonary function tests? Um, do we need a baseline x-ray? Auscultate the lungs. What do they sound like and is it going to change intra-op to pre-op? So that's a really good baseline. Lungs are clear and now post-op we have crackles. Okay, So that's telling us we may need a little diuretic because we've received a little bit of extra fluid during the during the intra-op stage. So that's another great example of why it's so important to get that baseline assessment. Uh, moving on to neurologic, okay? So a few examples of a history of a patient would be, do they have Parkinson's? Um, do they suffer from a seizure disorder? Have they had a stroke? Um, do they have any spinal cord disorders or injuries? Do they have MS? Okay, getting that baseline mentation, are they alert and oriented times three? Do they have Alzheimer's or dementia? Um, can they respond to questions appropriately? Can they follow commands appropriately? Okay, so getting that initial baseline, because if we're coming out of surgery and all of a sudden we're not following any commands and we're severely confused, that's a major issue um, that needs to be addressed. Getting that baseline neuro assessment is important for comparison. For So we're assessing their movement in all extremities. So what's their strength? Is it equal? Um, what do their pupils look like? Does the patient need a legal guardian or power of attorney to make decisions? Okay, so if they do have that Alzheimer's or dementia, you know, is the patient able to make that decision on their own for this procedure? And, and do they need help with doing that? We talked a little bit about that emergence delirium, especially in the elderly patients who may undergo anesthesia. Um, so it is a common thing um, for an elderly person or a person with Alzheimer's and dementia to get what is called an emergence delirium after anesthesia. And they remain confused, um, sometimes agitated, a little combative for some time after surgery. It takes you know, a long time to clear. Okay, So that's just something to be aware of. And it's just related to the added stress and anesthesia and any, you know, other drugs that have been added during the procedure to this to this patient. GU. So a few examples of history. Do they have any renal disease? Do Are they on dialysis? Do they get frequent UTIs? Um, what lab should we get as a baseline? And I know in class you had stated getting that BUN and creatinine level. Um, do this, does the patient have any issues with incontinence, any issues with hesitancy, retention? Um, this would be very important, you know, knowledge if we do need to insert a Foley catheter. Um, especially when the catheter comes out, we need to know if we'll have that um, retention post catheter, okay? Does the patient have an enlarged prostate? So if they do need to have a Foley catheter within surgery, we need to know if it's going to be a difficult catheterization. We may need a CUDE catheter if there is an enlarged prostate. Um, especially for women of childbearing age, are they pregnant? Um, when was their last menstrual period? And any recent UTIs? 
And moving on to musculoskeletal. So examples of the history of this would be any fractures, arthritis, osteoporosis, any contractures. Um, we need to know, especially in the ORs, are any mobility restrictions that can really influence intra uh, positioning. Um, we know sometimes that patients can be placed in some pretty odd positions depending on what type of procedure they're doing. Um, but we need to know if we can, if there's if there's a reason we can't move a patient a certain way on the OR table. Um, if they're doing spinal anesthesia, like a regional, um, it may be difficult for the patient not, not being able to flex their spine or round out their spine for the epidural. Neck mobility can be an issue, okay, especially with effects on the airway and intubation. So anesthesia during their consult will need to know if there is any issues with neck mobility. Like we talked about even neck size, neck mobility is an other issue that can affect the airway. And endocrine. So um, diabetic patients are at very high risk for any adverse effects in relation to anesthesia. Um, being either hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic can really play a role in delaying wound healing. And affections are so much more common, unfortunately, in diabetics. So we need to be really, really careful and have a very tight control on diabetic patients during surgery. Um, it's also important to clarify with the surgeon, you know, the dose of insulin, if any, that needs to be taken prior to surgery. Um, can they still take their oral hypoglycemic medication? Typically not. We usually put them right on sub-Q insulin. Um, so that needs to be discussed with the provider prior and educated with the patient. Um, during the surgical procedure, they'll be taking um, frequent blood sugars on the patient and making sure that they're in an adequate zone or range for their blood sugars. Um, of course, a serum glu glucose should be measured the morning of surgery, even for patients who aren't diabetic, for, but for those who are, it will be monitored throughout the entire procedure. All right, so those were our systems. Um, we're moving on to the American Society of Anesthesiologists classification system. Um, so this is a, a physical status rating, rating for anesthesia administration. Um, and it's an indicator for any, any risks, preoperative and really all the way through post-op, pre-op to post-op. So we discussed that P1 was a normal healthy person. P2 is a patient with mild systemic disease. P3 is a patient with severe systemic disease. P4 is a patient with severe systemic disease that is a threat to life. P5 is a patient who is not expected to survive without surgery. And P6 is a patient who is declared brain dead who um, will be doing harvesting on the patient. Um, and it was shared um, in class of a wonderful website that showed examples. And I know everyone got a copy of this, um, an email of through each stage, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, and P6, all um, examples of disease processes at that level. Some pre common pre-op diagnostic studies that um, providers like to have done, depending on sometimes the disease state of the patient um, or the type of procedure that they're getting done. So ABGs can be quite common, especially if there's a pulmonary procedure going on or a history of pulmonary disease. Um, pulse oximetry, getting that baseline, baseline blood glucose, um, BUN and creatinine, chest x-ray, a full CBC count. Uh, you'll find your H&H &H in there, right, red blood cells, white blood cells. You know, if we do have a bump in white blood cells, typically they will postpone the surgery. Okay, so anything that shows an increased risk of infection um, prior to surgery, we're at even higher risk to get even more of an infection after surgery. So that's why a lot of providers postpone. Echocardiogram, especially if there's a long-standing cardiac history going on, EKG is very typical. Um, getting electrolyte levels, pregnancy tests, liver functions, coags such as PT, PTT, INR, um, pulmonary function tests, and type and screen. So doing that pre-op teaching in relation to kind of the dynamics of the OR as well, 
Um, again, we're increasing patient comfort and satisfaction by alleviating any fears that they have. So it's really good to go over this um, pre-op teaching of the setting of the OR. And the first thing that we would want to talk about is the sensory information. So this is what they will, patients kind of hear, see, smell, feel. Um, so we can give some examples. You know, sometimes it may be a little noisy. Um, you may smell a lot of cleaning solutions. Um, it can be very cold. Lights may be bright. Um, there can be a lot of beeping from the monitors. Um, some examples like that for sensory. Process information is kind of detailed on where the patient's going throughout the OR. So where's the admission area? Where's the holding area? Where's the OR? Where's the PACU? Um, so details on the general flow and why they are going to be in which section and when. Um, when can family members be present? When should they go away to the waiting room? Where can they stay? Where are they, where are they gonna find their family members after they come out of surgery? And then procedural information. So this is just um, information they need to know, especially about you know um, their time of surgery. When do they need to arrive um, to the surgery site? Um, what should they wear to their procedure? Usually it's kind of loose fitted clothing, sweats. Um, what food restrictions do they have? Do they have any fluid or food restrictions? Usually it's NPO after midnight. Um, what do they need to do for cleansing prior to surgery? Insertion of any IV lines? Um, how will anesthesia be administered? And marking of the surgical site. And next is just some very general surgical information that we want to educate our patients to. So why do we need to cough and deep breathe? And a lot of times telling them this, even before their procedure, it kind of helps stick with them and has, it makes them think about some things for a little bit and the importance of why they need to do that. So teaching them a cough and deep breathe even prior to coming out of surgery is very helpful. And why do we do that? You know, preventing pneumonia, um, use of the incentive spirometer. Again, we want to make sure the lungs, you know, um, have proper inflation, um, preventing pneumonia, utilizing TEDs and venous boots. We want to prevent any clots from forming, um, educate the patient if they're going to have any tubes or drains post-surgery, why will they have those tubes and drains um, and what, you know, they're going to see when they come out of surgery. Um, educating the patient on how we use the 0 to 10 pain scale, um, why we do so, and what we can medicate at like each stage of the pain level, um, you know, for mild pain, moderate, or um, extreme pain. And educating the patient on why we do NPO after midnight, okay? Sometimes the background and why we do the way things the way we do helps the patient understand things a little bit more. So, you know, NPO after midnight really helps reduce the risk of any pulmonary aspiration and it also helps with controlling nausea and vomiting a little bit better. Um, this is just an example. Um, we really stick to the NPO after midnight, but I did want to share with you um, preoperative fasting recommendations per the American Society of Anesthesiologists. So it's a little less strict, um, but I just wanted you to see this. I want you to know NPO after midnight, okay? Um, but I just included this for you to know the American Society of Anesthesiologists recommendations. So if we're eight hours prior to surgery, the patient can eat a regular heavy meal. It can be fried or fatty. Um, six hours prior is a light meal, um, like toast or clear liquids. Um, six hours prior can be milk, um, if, it, if we're talking about more pediatrics and an infant is infant formula. Um, four hours prior, if we're talking about an infant or pediatrics, is breast milk. And two hours prior would be clear liquids, so water. If there is a clear tea, they can have clear tea. Black coffee is not considered a clear liquid, though. Um, carbonated beverages, such as a ginger ale um, or seltzer, 
um, and fruit juice without pulp. And then the nurses roll the day of surgery. Okay, so this is kind of what we need to do. So say we just got on shift at 7 a.m. and our patient's going down to surgery that day. Um, these are some things that we really need to think about. So we're going over any final pre-op teaching that maybe hasn't been done or reteaching the things the patient may have not have understood. Um, we're ensuring that any pre-op orders are completed. We're making sure that the patient did get all the labs that they had ordered, all the diagnostic tests that were ordered are done. So we're making sure to go through that and that the patient has completed all of that. Did the patient maintain their NPO status after midnight? Is there a signed informed consent, um, especially for surgery? There's an informed consent for anesthesia and a blood product is also very important, blood consent. Um, laboratory results and diagnostics results and have they resulted? Consultations of the patient should all be placed in the patient's chart and the H and P should also be placed in the patient's chart. Uh, baseline vital signs. We need to make sure that the patient had, has had proper skin preparation and cleansing. Um, we would need to make sure that the surgical site has been identified and marked by the provider. Does the patient agree to the surgical site? Remove any dentures, jewelry, glasses, contacts, hearing aids, rings, bracelets, necklaces. Um, Everything should be removed from the patient. Also encouraging the patient to void prior to going to the OR. Um, an empty bladder will really help prevent any involuntary elimination during the procedure, and it also reduces the risk of retention. So you'll see a lot more nowadays that patients really do not even get calf during surgery. It depends on the length of the procedure and the provider's preference. But more so than not, lately, um, we've been steering clear of, of Foley catheters being used within the OR, okay? It just really reduces the risk, of course, for number one infection and reduces the risk for retention. So going over this wash, the chlorhexidine wash, um, we use the example of um, having surgery on a Wednesday. So this bath, the bath is the photo on the right here. It's, it's the, the, um, the bottle of CHG, also known as chlorhexidine. And the patient needs to start bathing two pre-op evenings prior to surgery. So if we're talking Wednesday, the patient needs to start Monday evening doing a full head-to-toe bath with this bottle. We, the patient will also need to do one Tuesday evening. And then the last bath should be the morning of. So we have Monday evening, Tuesday evening, and if it's the morning of, it's going to be Wednesday morning, okay? So there's a total of three CHG baths head to toe that the patient needs to do, okay? And then the CHG wipes, which is the photo on the left-hand side, needs to be done just prior going into surgery. Typically that is done in the holding area, the pre-op area, um, prior to going into the OR, and it, the wipes are the site. So for example, we talked about if we're doing a right total knee, we're going to wipe the right thigh, the right knee, and probably the right shin. So it's just the area. It's not a head-to-toe wipe, but it's the area of the surgery. So it's more localized. So this is best practice um, as up to date as 2020, and it hasn't changed since then, okay? And this really helps prevent any surgical site infections. Next is DNR in the OR. So this can be confusing for some people, but um, really, um, typically DNR is rescinded in the OR. A lot of providers may not even do surgery if the patient still like would like to remain a DNR DNI. Um, they're just putting, I don't want to have it come across like this, but the effort that everyone's putting in, the time and the, and the cost of surgery um, for, you know, possible DNR, DNI um, is usually out of the question. Um, so DNR status will be rescinded within the OR and they will be resuscitated if needed. Um, so the question is, when do we take off their purple band? Okay, do we take it off on the unit they're coming from? When do we take it off? 
So prior to entering the OR, the provider will remove the DNR band and it will be replaced upon exit of the OR. So in the PACU, the band will be placed back on. Okay, so this is not happening on the floor. Um, this happens within the OR of the removal and it gets placed after the patient leaves the OR, okay? So common pre-op medications, um, antibiotics are a big one, right? We use antibiotics for prophylactic therapy. Um, the most typical antibiotic you'll see is cefazolin, also known as ANCEF, and it prevents any post-op infections. Um, anticholinergics, okay, so these really help um, oral and respiratory secretions and can also help with nausea and vomiting. Uh, the scopolamine patch is a really great example of an anticholinergic. Antidiabetics, insulin helps stabilize blood glucose. Antiemetics, okay, so anti-nausea medications, um, Zofran, Phenergan. Benzodiazepines, so these can help with anxiety. It can also be an inductor for sedation. Um, Valium, Ativan, Versed are all examples of this. Beta blockers, if they're having severe hypertension prior to procedure. Um, metoprolol, labetalol can manage hypertension. Um, histamine receptor antagonists. So this can be for any allergic, you know, it can be a Benadryl if they're having any allergic reactions. Opioids for pain if they're having any pain prior to procedure. Morphine, Dilaudid, fentanyl. And the intra-op environment. So there are zones. So the first zone we're going to talk about is unrestricted zone. So this is a zone that people can wear street clothes in. They can interact with those actually in, in scrubs. Um, it can, it's like point of entry. It is the area like the holding area. And it's also the area such as locker rooms and the nurse's station. And then we move to semi-restricted zones. So we're getting a little bit more aseptic. Um, so this is the surrounding and support areas and corridors. Only authorized personnel are allowed in these areas and clean surgical attire should be worn, such as you know the clean surgical scrubs, booties, headwear, mask. And then you guys know what the restricted zone is and that, that's really the OR suite. So you are scrubbed in, you're gowned, um, you're aseptic, you have your mask on. Um, I don't want you to confuse, like a lot of people call the area pre-op area, some people call it the holding area. Um, we have like a surgical day area that we call it. Um, so those are all interchangeable um, terms here. So I just wanted you to understand that that can be the holding area could be used interchangeably between like surgical day and the pre-op area. And this physical layout is really meant to prevent any cross-contamination. So it's pretty well thought out for the OR layout. And then we're going into intra-op nursing duties here. So this, um, this is what our intra-op nurse does, okay? So we've gone from pre-op, now we're talking about intra-op. So our OR nurse will help prepare the OR suite. Um, this nurse is ensuring that supplies and equipment are available in the OR, depending on the procedure that's going on. They're helping maintain aseptic technique for themselves and also making sure that everyone else practices aseptic technique, so they're the monitor for everyone else. They help gown and glove the surgical team. They make sure to check mechanical and electrical equipment that it's working properly. Um, they, can, they help conduct the pre-procedure verification process. So right patient, right site, um, right procedure. They're helping assess the, the physical and emotional status of the patient, okay? Um, applying and monitoring devices and assisting with the, any insertion of an invasive lines. 
um, helping assist with safety of transferring the patient and positioning the patient, helping the patient get on the OR table, and then putting in them, them in the proper position for the procedure. Um, where the nurse in the OR is helping aid in any anesthesia induction. They monitor and assist with draping of the patient. And they, like I said, again, surgical timeouts, which we'll talk about in a little bit, they take part in. Um, they're the recorder of everything. So anything, any care done intra-op is done by the OR nurse, okay? Um, they can help pass instru instruments to the first assist, to the scrub tech, to the surgeons. Um, they can help label, send off specimens, especially if biopsies need to be sent or certain labs. They can help label and send those off. Um, they're measuring any blood output as well as any transfusions needed within the OR, so blood output or input, also urine output, and any other fluid gains or losses. They're confirming, dispensing, recording drugs. So they're really helping with recording of the drug administration. They're keeping a correct count of sponges, needles, and instruments, which is so important. And they really, at the end, they help facilitate the transfer to the PACU and they give handoff to the PACU nurse. And these were some examples we went over just for some surgical positioning. And you guys were great about these. You told me that um, a is supine. You told me that B is Trendelenburg. You told me that C is reverse Trendelenburg. D is a lithotomy position. E is a lateral decubitus. F is a jackknife, or lateral jackknife, I should say. G is a lateral kidney, H is prone, and I is sitting position. So we're making sure as the nurse in the OR that the patient has correct musculoskeletal alignment. We're making sure we prevent any injury from happening. We're preventing pressure ulcers from forming. We're making sure that there's not too much pressure on a certain area. The OR has wonderful like pads and gels that are used for support systems and um, to prevent any skin breakdown. Um, we're making sure to prevent any occlusion of arteries and veins, and of course, providing modesty. This was a wonderful video I thought of scrubbing in, very interesting. And then we talked a little bit about electrosurgery and smoke. Um, so there can be fires in the OR and we need to do everything to help prevent those. Um, so when an electrical surgical unit is in use, a patient really must be pro properly grounded, okay? And we use electrical electrosurgery all the time. I mean, we're cauterizing patients constantly. Um, it's very, very common for an electrosurgical unit to be used. So the patient will need the grounding pad on. Um, so that's imperative, and it's going to help prevent any injury from burns and fire. Um, and that pad can go on a well vascularized muscle, muscle mass. Um, so sometimes, like the thigh, is very typical. Sometimes a bicep, depending on the site of the procedure. And then there was a little video on this as well. And this photo was an example of a grounding pad that is used. And the timeout, such an important piece of, of the procedure, of the surgical procedure. Um, it's a national patient safety goal, um, and it's a procedure verification process that needs to be done, and sometimes is done very frequently throughout the surgical day. It can be done on the unit that the patient's coming from, when they get to pre-surgery, when they get into the OR, um, and sometimes even PACU. Um, so all members of the surgical team stop what they're doing. Um, a lot of times it's really great to involve the patient in this. Um, they can state their name and date of birth for you, and they can agree to the proper surgical site and procedure that's going on. So I know this is probably more done with the patient pre-op. Intra-op, sometimes it is done when the patient is asleep. So depending on the, the facility um, and how much they 
you know, have the patient interact at that time. So typically this is, you know, done prior to anesthesia induction. We ask the patient there to confirm their name and date of birth. If the patient is under anesthesia, we of course use their wristband and their medical record to do so. Um, we confirm the pr correct procedure that they're having done. We confirm the correct surgical site and consent, okay? So we're preventing three things. Wrong site, wrong procedure, wrong surgery. Um, this has happened so much throughout, you know, nationally in the United States. Um, wrong procedures have been done. We've taken out an appendix for no reason. We've amputated a limb that shouldn't have been amputated. Um, we might have amputated the wrong limb when it should have been the other. Um, it's a really important process and a huge safety process. And um, this is a universal protocol. Also, I wanted to go over the Surgical Care Improvement Project. Um, surgeries, um, especially orthopedic surgeries, are filed quite closely and were graded, um, were graded on many things, especially infection um, is a big one. And that's why smoking and having an upper respiratory infection or UTI um, is so important for the provider to know pre-procedure because if they do, they know that they'll probably have a more of increased risk of infection post-procedure. Um, so that's why they'll postpone those surgeries. But we're reducing complications from surgeries through these th three things at least. So we're giving prophylactic antibiotics and it needs to be started within 30 to 60 minutes prior to a surgical incision. And that will be checked upon either with JACO or whatever type of um, facility is grading the, the surgical procedure. Next is applying a warming blanket to prevent any hypothermia. And three is applying SCD boots, of course, to prevent any clots from forming. And this was a video of anesthesia. I apologize again for that background music. I do see how it is distracting. Um, I do how she like. I like how she went through the different types of anesthetics or sedation and regional techniques. Um, but really, general anesthesia is the technique of choice for many surgical procedures, um, especially if the surgical procedure is pretty significant in duration. Um, if it's a very, you know, short procedure, like an hour or so, um, we may go more to the um, and more induction sed sedative medications such as, you know, fentanyl, Versed, um, propofol. Um, but general really has the patient in full skeletal muscle relaxation, like it's a state of hypnosis. Um, and it, it, the patient will be in a very comfortable position during the surgery. And these are some common general anesthetic medications that we went over. Not just one can be used. Um, multiple of these groups of medications can be used depending on what the anesthesiologist wants to use and how it will affect the patient. And that's why that pre-op interview with anesthesia is so important. So non-barbiturate hypnotics, the common ones for these I want you to know is atomidate and propofol. Um, what we want to observe for this is any nausea and vomiting, hiccups, hypotension, and hypoglycemia. We have inhalation agents such as nitric, nitrous oxide, um, very common. We do need to monitor the patient for extreme nausea and vomiting, and we want to stay away with this for bone marrow depression. Um, nitrous oxide must be given with oxygen to prevent any hypoxemia, and we really need to monitor any nausea and vomiting. And again, avoiding in patients with bone marrow depression. Um, I did, we did talk about propofol a little bit, and if propofol was used a little bit more long term, um, say more for patients who are intubated for quite some time, have been on propofol, it's probably important just to monitor their trig triglyceride levels because it is a fat medication. Um, it's very, very similar to lipids. 
um, or like a fat emulsion. So monitoring serum triglycerides, especially when intubation lasts more than 24 hours is, is, a, is a good practice to use. Then there's dissociative and anesthetic, which is ketamine. Um, not too much of adverse reactions, but sometimes there can be hallucinations and agitation. Um, what would help with this if, if, if a benzo was added, like an Ativan, Valium, Versed, um, can help with agitation or hallucinations. Next is neuromuscular blocking agents, and these really are paralytics. Um, so succinylcholine, rocuronium, and Nimbex. So these help with muscle relaxation, um, hypotension, and prolonged respiratory depression. Or what I should say to watch out for is hypotension and prolonged respiratory depression, excuse me. Um, but these neuromuscular blocking agents help with skeletal muscle relaxation. Um, we also want to monitor for any nausea and vomiting. And lastly, there's volatile liquids. Um, to these two, I want you to know is suprane and forane. So it's important to monitor any return of muscle reflexes and strength. Um, we want to monitor the level of consciousness of the patient and, of course, maintaining a patent airway. Next is the role of the nurse with anesthetic induction. Okay, so during induction, maintenance, and emergence. So during each stage, what can we help the anesthesiologist with? So all general anesthesia begins with an IV induction. And if you remember that, that is typically like a um, fentanyl, Versed, sometimes a little bit of propofol. Um, sometimes atomidate. So this first dose of these induction agents, you know, they only last a few minutes and they actually help with timing of just getting your endotracheal tube placed in an airway. And then typically inhalation agents are after your induction agents. So your nitrous oxide, and that will be given through the endotracheal tube, the gas, okay? So during induction, um, as a nurse, we're helping with any application of monitors and we're assisting with airway management. So we're helping get that airway into the patient. During the maintenance phase, you know, this is when the patient's receiving um, either the gas or maybe a little bit more induction agent or sedative, is that we're adjusting the patient's position as needed and we're monitoring the safety of the patient, monitoring vital signs. And then the emergence phase is when we're coming off of these medications. So we're helping protect any, um, the return of reflexes during this time. We're helping place the dressing on the patient, patient and we're helping them prepare to move to PACU. And then this is actually the role of the anesthesiologist or even the CRNA during general anesthesia. So during the induction point and during induction medications is we're giving the appropriate drugs or the anesthesiologist is giving the appropriate drugs they're helping secure the airway so these are the ones that are actually intubating the patient and securing the airway and helping and positioning of the patient appropriately as well during the maintenance phase throughout the procedure they're monitoring the physiological status of the patient they're titrating any drugs that needs titrating, they're giving any more sedative medications that need, be, that need to be given, um, titrating fluids as well. And then during the emergence phase, which is the patient is coming off of anesthesia, they're helping reverse any neuromuscular blocking agents if there was any. Again, that is like a paralytic. Um, where they're assessing for any return of reflexes. They're helping remove airway assisted devices once the patient is safe enough to have their airway removed and of course assessing pain, okay? Um, we talked about some crisis events um, that can happen during surgery and anaphylaxis can be quite common. Um, so we know it's the most severe form of an allergic reaction where it's actually affecting us systemically. 
Okay, so it's very life threatening and it affects us more so in the pulmonary and circulatory systems and we have pulmonary and circulatory compromise. Um, so this can be affected by anesthetic agents, antibiotics can cause reactions and even latex if we didn't know of a latex allergy. Um, so the patient can become very hypotensive and tachycardic. Um, they can run into bronchospasms and really respiratory distress and develop pulmonary edema. Um, so we need to, of course, go to our anaphylaxis kit. They're located on all the emergency carts in the facility. Um, within this kit, we, of course, have the number one line drug here of epinephrine. Epinephrine is a life-saving drug for an anaphylaxis reaction. There is also Benadryl. Um, there is Solumedrol or Solucortef. Um, there is also breathing treatments in there as well to help open up the airways a little bit better. Um, next is malignant hyperthermia or MH. It's really not common, but a very important thing to know and understand. And it's really hypermetabolism of skeletal muscle. And when that happens, it's resulting from altered, there, there's an altered control of intracellular calcium. Okay, so hypermetabolic or hypermetabolism of skeletal muscle and it alters the control of intracellular calcium. So the patient will have extreme skeletal muscle rigidity from this um, and they will be hyperthermic. Okay, so they'll have an elevated temperature. Um, again, hypermetabolism of skeletal muscle, which causes an altered control of intracellular calcium. It's really occurs in actually susceptible patients, and it's more of a genetic trait than anything. That's why it's so important to get that family history. If anyone in their family has been through MH before, that would be a huge red flag to, to notify the provider for or anesthesia. Um, this occurs under general anesthesia or in post-op. Typically, we see this more in post-op care. Um, and the real causative agents that they found with research is that if the patient has received succinylcholine given with an inhalation agent, like a gas, um, can, be, can put patients into MH. Again, we have an altered control of intracellular calcium. Um, it causes muscle contractures. The patient becomes hyperthermic, um, hypoxic. They have an elevated venous lactate level um, because lactic acidosis is occurring. Um, the patient can be tachycardic. And prompt administration of dantrolene is, is the life-saving drug for this medication. So it's going to reverse um, the effects of MH. So dantrolene will do that. I know ROR has a malignant hyperthermia kit with dantrolene located right within it. So it will help slow the metabolism of skeletal muscle and it will help reduce contractures. Um, the fever actually is a late stage, later sign of this. Um, we tend to see the muscle rigidity and the muscle contractures first. Um, and the increased fever uh, is typically a later sign. And then we're going to pack you, so we're handing off, okay? So this is what we um, need to know to give PACU report. So giving a thorough history and baseline assessment of the patient. Um, hopefully the patient has maintained at their baseline and hasn't changed. Um, the we, the um, PACU nurse needs to know the surgeon and the procedure done. Um, is there any presence of tubes, drains, IVs, catheters um, that the nurse will have in the PACU? Um, what type of anesthesia did the patient receive? Was it general? Was it regional? Was it both? Um, and the medications that were used during the procedure. Um, what's the airway status? Were they able to extubate the patient just fine and they're on a simple face mask? Are they still intubated? How's the pain management with the patient right now? When was the last dose of pain medication? 
um, what type of IV fluids were administered in, in the OR, are they still receiving those fluids, um, how much fluids did they receive in, what was the output in the OR, was there any blood loss, did they need any blood transfusions. Again, pain management in any, any of the course intra-opt and anything go unexpected, um, any unexpected events. And when we get to PACU, this is called phase one. Um, phase two is typically when we're transferring the patient up to whatever unit they will be on. But so right for right now, we're gonna just talk about phase one. And we've now received PACU report from the OR. And the first thing we need to do when that patient comes to our PACU is we need to get those, what's the airway? How's the airway? Okay, is the patient breathing okay? Um, are they having increased work of breathing? Are they any, in any respiratory distress? So ABCs, ABCs. Um, getting that set of vital signs. So wheeling them into their bay in the PACU, putting them on the bedside monitor, and getting that first set of vital signs as a baseline. And tidal CO2 is wonderful, should be used a lot more. Um, I think we're doing better with that, with using untitled CO2. Um, it's also called um, waveform capnographer, capnography. So it's actually helping us determine how well the patient's oxygenating um, by the number of the untitled CO2. Um, if the patient is hypoventilating for any reason, they're not blowing in off enough CO2, are they hyperventilating? Are they blowing off too much CO2? So it gives us a kind of a better definitive measure of how the patient's breathing and oxygenating, sometimes even more than an O2 sap. Um, EKG monitoring, and that's right on their bedside monitor. So we put them right on the leads. Um, again, we're monitoring the airway, which is so important. If they needed any invasive monitoring, um, such as like A-lines or um, central line placement that we're making sure that that's maintained in the PACU. Did they need to be kept on a ventilator and maintaining intubation and ventilation within the PACU? Um, during those, doing those neuro checks, making sure that they're still maintaining at baseline. Are their pupils still baseline? How's their level of consciousness? Are they, how's their motor function? Um, measuring INOs continuously, um, monitoring catheters, IVs, and drains, and of course, what's really important is assessing the surgical site. So um, making sure that there's no extra bleeding, drainage, hematomas at the site, dehiscence, has a surgical incision come apart for any reason. Um, so again, being alert for any respiratory distress, hypotension, any dysrhythmias, changes in heart rate, is there bleeding, hematomas at the surgical site, is there any neurological deficit, are they having urinary retention, did we take the Foley catheter out and they can't void, um, are they having any nausea. So here we are again, um, just kind of a review of that initial PACU assessment. So airway, is it patent? Okay, is there any airways needed? Do they still have an endotracheal tube on a ventilator? Um, how's their respiratory rate? How's their quality of breathing? What's their pulse oximetry level? How's their untitled CO2 level? What are their breath sounds sound like? Do they have more crackles than what was stated from report? Um, does the patient need any supplemental O2? Um, circulation, how's their EKG? Is there any arrhythmias going on? How's their blood pressure? Are they hypertensive, hypotensive? Do they still require an arterial line, which is an invasive line? Um, how's their temperature readings, okay? Capillary refill, how's their color and temperature of the skin? Do they have good apical and peripheral pulses? Neurologically, how's their level of consciousness? How's their orientation? Are they confused? Um, can they follow commands? Can they move all extremities equal, equally with full strength? Um, how's their pupillary reactions? And again, sensory and motor status. Um, other miscellaneous, following their urine output, whether it's voiding normally or with a Foley catheter, assessing their surgical site and dressing, um, monitoring drains, how's their IV assessment look like? 
INOs again, nausea, vomiting. Are there bowel sounds, especially if it was a, a bowel procedure or abdominal procedure? And making sure that they're um, as close to pain free as possible. And potential complications that can happen after surgery. There's quite a bit, um, but these are the ones that I want you to know. So we talked about delirium, especially in the elderly, um, maybe in the patients who have dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, do they have a fever, okay? Is the fever quite high? Are they having those symptoms along with like muscle contractions um, that we should raise a red flag to malignant hyperthermia? Um, are they having hypothermia? Should they need a warming blanket? Um, that's very common after anesthesia to feel so cold. Okay, so do they need a warmer for a little bit? Is the patient having any abdominal distension or gas? Are they hiccuping? Do they have a lot of hiccups? Um, are they having nausea and vomiting, that, which we should control? Um, is there a post-op ileus? So there is, you know, no motility in the gut. Um, there may be an obstruction. Um, and that would be a concern for the provider or surgeon. As a patient having urinary retention, are they, have, are they having symptoms of a possible urinary infection? Um, any atelectasis or um, bronchospasms going on? Are we having any respiratory distress? Hypoxemia, um, do we know any signs of pneumonia? Any pulmonary edema or increased fluid in the lungs, crackles, do they need diuretics? Um, any symptoms of a PE? Um, dysrhythmias, are they hemorrhaging? Are there vital signs showing that they're in a um, shocky state of hypotension, tachycardia? Any signs of a DVT? Um, how is the surgical site? Is there any dehiscence? Is there a hematoma or does it look infected? Um, how is the airway? Is there any airway obstruction? Um, and has the patient had any aspiration? So I wanted to talk a little bit about respiratory complications and really airway obstruction can be quite common, especially if the patient is still kind of still stuporous or sleepy and they have taken, they have removed the endotracheal tube. Um, sometimes if they're still sleepy, their tongue can slip back into the, you know, soft palate of their mouth and, and occlude the pharynx. So there can be total blockage of the airway due to the tongue. So do we want to place a patient in a supine position? Probably not, and this is where it most often occurs is in a supine position. Well, we're gonna talk about a certain position the patient should be in in a little bit. Um, so of course, the best thing to do with this is that, you know, that remember that head tilt, jaw lift, um, it helps get that tongue out of the way and it helps open the airway. And we'll be putting them in that lateral recovery position, which both we'll talk about in a minute. There can be laryngeal edema. Okay, so that can actually happen um, due to maybe an allergic drug reaction. It could be irritation from the endotracheal tube. Um, so really corticosteroids are a huge help with laryngeal edema, oxygen therapy, and if it's severe, possible need for reintubation. Um, all, again, laryngeal spasm can be possible irritation from the endotracheal tube. Um, even retain thick secretions or mucus plugging. Um, even suctioning, deep suctioning can help with this. Coughing, deep breathing, and adding hydration. There can be issues with aspiration, especially if the patient has vomited. Um, so we want to add oxygen to the patient. We want to suction the patient, and we probably will need antibiotics. Um, pulmonary edema. If the patient has gotten a lot of fluids or blood products within the OR, um, they're going to need oxygen therapy and probably some diuretics to take some fluid off. And pulmonary embolism, we really all know the treatment for a PE. So here's a good picture of the um, elevation of the jaw, kind of clearing mandible and we're lifting up the jaw to clear the airway. So head tilt and jaw lift. 
and um, the airway is cleared and the tongue does not rest anymore on the soft palate of the pharynx. And then I just want to go over, you know, some signs, you know, some systems of the body. So we're going to go from neuro, um, probably all the way to GU, um, and the signs of inadequate oxygenation throughout the body system. So if we first start, let's say the cardiac system, what are some signs that we're having inadequate oxygenation cardiac wise? Could be hyper hypotensive, so we could have blood pressure changes. The patient can be tachycardic or bradycardic, or they can have dysrhythmias. We can probably have chest pain or angina. Um, delayed capillary refill, we might have weak pulses peripherally, um, and also a decreased oxygen saturation. Neurologically, the patient can be confused, restless, agitated. Skin-wise, the patient can have cyanosis. It can feel cool and moist. Renal, they can have a decreased urine output, for sure. Respiratory, we'll see accessory muscle use, abdominal breath sounds. Um, they'll have an increased work of breathing. Our O2 sat will be off. Um, we'll have impaired gas exchange. Okay. And then this is the lateral recovery position, which we were talking about, especially for a patient who is still very stuporous and sleeping, um, just out of the OR, who is not quite awake yet. We'd want to place them on the sideline position. It really helps keep the airway open. It reduces any risk for aspiration, if the, especially if the patient were to vomit. Um, once the patient's more conscious and awake, we can lay them more supine, more in the sitting position than anything. We would help elevate the head of the bed. And of course, continue to encourage that cough and deep breathe, the incentive spirometer, and, and the splint. And if they do have an incision, we can help splint that incision. We can put a pillow. If they do need to cough and deep breathe, we teach them how to splint with that pillow or blanket. And then discharge criteria, okay? So this is when the patient's ready to leave the PACU and they're safe enough to go up to the, to the unit. Um, so the patient needs to be awake and arousable. Their vital signs should be as close to baseline as possible. Um, no excess bleeding or drainage from the incision site. Um, no respiratory depression and their respiratory should be back to baseline as much as possible. Yes, they may still be coming up on a simple face mask or nasal cannula, but that's just to offer a little bit more oxygen at this point in time. Um, their pain should be adequately controlled um, and also their nausea and vomiting should be adequately controlled as well. And really when they come up to the unit, we're kind of doing the same thing all over again that the PACU nurse did when the patient arrived to them. So we're assessing their airway when they come up to that clinical unit. Um, we're getting that set of vital signs. We're doing those post-op vital signs. Um, remember, it's the Q15 minutes times four, Q30 minutes times two, and Q1 hours times four. How's the patient's mentation? Are they alert and oriented? Do they seem confused? How's their movement in all extremities? How's their level of pain? Assessing the surgical site, assessing any drains and tubes, um, that were given in report. Um, is everything connected properly once they reach the clinical unit? Is the oxygen connected to the wall? Is the Foley bag down below the level of the bladder? How's their IV lines? Okay, if they're hooked up to suction, are they? If they have chest tubes, do they need to be hooked up to suction? If they have an NG tube, is that hooked up to suction? Um, how's the color and appearance and temperature of the skin? Is the patient in a comfortable position? Um, do they need a refill of their ice bag? Um, how's their urinary status? Are they retaining fluid or are they retaining urine? Are they able to void or do they still have a Foley catheter? Is their nausea and vomit, vomiting under control? And how's their family doing? And did they see their family yet? So that is it, guys. Um, I hope this is helpful for your exam. Um, again, if you have any further questions, please feel free to email me. Um, I'd be happy to answer them for you. And thank you for listening to me once again.